As I said, we have a very strong panel here today. We have uh, Carol Comerton Ford, who's a professor of finance from University of Melbourne. We have uh, Jens Hendriksson, who's the CEO of Folksam, yes. a large insurance firm. And uh, Andreas Wollheim, who's uh, working at SEB Investment Management uh, as the head of trading and treasury. And uh, finally, we have Fredrik Ekström, who's from NASDAQ, where he's the head of uh, their uh, fixed income and European clearing, and also the chairman of uh, NASDAQ clearing. So very welcome to all of you. And uh, Yasid will be joining us in the panel from, from this side. So I would like to begin with um, uh, reflecting on the past 10 years in uh, perhaps uh, primarily the equity markets, but to all financial markets, we have seen an increase of uh, fast trading and algorithmic trading and an uh, uh, increase in fragmentation of markets where we can trade different assets, which uh, is uh, also a strong driver of the, um, of the rise of algorithmic trading. Uh, this has uh, perhaps led to a, a better market uh, or, or a worse market, depending on how you see, see it. I think for sure we can say that it has led to a more complex market and uh, uh, posing a, a growing challenge to the investors who, who need to navigate in this uh, landscape. So uh, uh, I'd like to ask you how, how you see this and uh, how... Um, institutions can navigate in, in this landscape. And perhaps I'll start with you, Carol. Uh, you've done a lot of research on uh, dark pools and on fast trading. So what is your view on, on this? Sure. Um, so I think you know, over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of academic work looking at these issues. And undoubtedly, markets are more complex. Um, a lot of the academic work looking at high frequency trading and algorithmic trading has pointed towards there being benefits um, from that. So um, improvements in the supply of liquidity, um, improvements in very short term price discovery. Um, I wanted to talk about just two papers that have focused very much on the on the speed issue. One is Bjorn's work with his co-authors. Um, so he's done I didn't some work. That. No, no, this is not <laughs> not coerced, but a very interesting paper, um, looking at the Nordic markets, looking at um, an optional capacity for market makers to use. Um, faster co-location um, capacity. And in doing so, what that enabled them to do was to reduce their adverse selection costs, to reduce their inventory constraints, and therefore provide more liquidity to the market. Correct me if I've misrepresented your work. Perfect. But so, so that work would suggest that faster trading, um, at least enabling market makers to trade more quickly, enables them to provide better sources of liquidity to the market. Uh, another interesting paper um, by Andre Shkilko, uh, which looks at the US markets uh, and looks at uh, bad weather events. So when bad weather um, affects the use of microwave technology um, and therefore slows down the very fastest traders in the market. And what he finds is that when that happens, um, you reduce adverse selection costs, you reduce volatility, and you increase liquidity in the market. So by sort of re-leveling the playing field and not allowing the guys who have the fastest advantage in the market, by bringing everyone back onto a more level playing field, that actually produces benefits for the market. And his work also showed that when you dem uh, democratise the access to microwaves, that also improved the quality of the liquidity in the market. So I think the evidence is mixed in terms of speed has definitely brought some benefits to the market, but if you create a very unlevel playing field, then that perhaps imposes costs. Um, but I definitely agree with Yazid's comments that I think we're coming to the end of that speed race. So those uh, sort of distortions in who can access what um, is certainly being reduced. Thank you. So, so uh, Jens, uh, do, do you think the, the benefits uh, exceed the, the costs of this market structure that, has, that we have obtained over the last 10 years? Yes. Do you want me to say something more? <laughs> okay. So uh, let me be a little bit uh, longer then. Uh, so put it like this. Um, I think I'm a pretty good 
let's be honest, I think I'm a pretty good choice to be in this panel. And the reason for that is that 25 years ago I did my dissertation about uh, artic artificial intelligence. So I used that to predict newspapers, uh, newspaper sales. Then uh, I was the head of a stock exchange and I was one of the biggest defenders of, of, of the robots and I was a lot in the media at that time. And now I'm head of, of a large institutional in investor. So I think that is a good sort of uh, uh, starting point. Now, my point then is that um, all that you come to Folksam, and um, um, Folksam was is like a hundred year old institution, and um, we were on the forefront of digitization. So in 1956, we're in the front page of Svenska Dagbladet, a big uh, Swedish newspaper, and it said uh, the first electronic brain came to Sweden. It was bought by Folksam, and it was transported uh, through a KLM plane. It was an IBM 65000. So we were first. Uh, so we were the uh, sort of the, the the first one de dealing with fintech. The problem is it. That computer is still running an old life system in the basement. Uh, we are lagging behind. Uh, I've sort of used the last three or four years just to do a lot of, of technology. And I have tons of systems. I have Fortran programmers. I have COBOL. I have everything. Uh, and it's uh, extremely complicated. So uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point then is that uh, uh, we are work with asset liability management, which is a different thing. That's important to keep in mind. We have a liability on one side, and we're going to use the asset that matches that on the other side. And that means that we're not like really working to get the extra 0.0001% every day, because we need just to match our liabilities. Uh, what we do then is that we follow indexes. That's the whole idea. We follow indexes, and so far we're pretty big, but we're not the biggest in Sweden, and that means that we do not need to be active on each different equities. We follow and we, we, we do futures, we do OMX, S&P 500, and, and Eurostox, Eurostox. So that's what we do. So, and those are highly liquid market. And the good point for us is that, well, that's where the digital revolution and, and all the markets have made it better, more liquid, and, and faster. So it works very good. And sometimes we do a big thing, and we do a big thing, well, let's be honest, this is the least of our worries. We need to think about media, conflicts of interest, and blah, 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 all the hundreds of, and, and just getting the 0.001 extra percent, it's, it's the least. So my point is that uh, we are, uh, we think this development has been pretty good for us. Uh, we think it will continue. It will be no, uh, won't be easy to, to stop. And the good thing is also, we are also now learning to playing around a bit. We are sort of trying to create our own strategies. And the funny thing is we can do it now just by buying a plug-in. We don't, before we need to go to a hedge fund to do it. Now we can just play around. So yes, we think this development is good. So, uh, Andreas, if Jens thinks this is a small part of the operation, I think it's at the core of your operation, representing many large institutional investors and taking their orders to the market. So how, how do you um, uh, navigate this complex market and uh, is there any way you think it, it uh, should be changed uh, looking ahead? Well, uh, Jens is a big fish and uh, I'm a small fish, so this is from my small fish um, uh, perspective. Um, so I run the trading desk at SCB Investment Management, and we do hundreds of thousands of equity trades and hundreds of thousands of FX and fixed income trades every year. Um, so we need to have a great stability in, in all our operations, obviously. And our main focus is to, like I said before, minimize market impact. Uh, because any, any, any cost, all cost of the trade goes directly from the alpha of the trade. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that fragmentation as a general rule has been good. I think uh, um, we, we have, we've managed to increase what we do in, uh, as a part of the liquidity. So our participation rate when we do executions have increased over time. And, uh, uh, I'm not saying that's because of the uh, fragmentation, but it's because of new innovations that comes from the fragmentation. So we today use, uh, on, 
we use a lot of block type uh, uh, electronic solutions mm -hmm. to try to find the other side. Um, and I think that's helped us a lot. Um, the new regulation coming online now could potentially be, um, and no one really knows this at this point, but that could be something that will actually be detrimental to liquidity overall for us. Um, I'll, I'll give you an ex example. Um, there are at least five different liquidity providers that we can interact with and want to interact with before we talk to a broker. Um, I'm talking like initiatives like LiquidNet or ITG's POSIT, um, BATS bids that come online in the last six months, uh, Euronext block that's uh, launched only uh, this summer, I think, and Turquoise Plato. Um, these are types of, of venues that we want to interact with before we, we give our hand to a broker, before we try to find the, the block on the other side and, and try to give the broker an order to find the other side. Um, and we're faced with the complexity now that if I'm in one of these systems, the other side of the trade might be in one of the other four. So I might have to have some, sort of a smart order router internally to kind of source liquidity from these, all these places. Um, so, I mean, the complexity in doing this for hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of trades every year uh, becomes very complex. Mm. Um, so that's one point. So I, I'm, I think that fragmentation might be, you know, it's whenever the rules change a little bit, the market's response is to come up with new order types and launch new venues. And, and that's very in, uh, good innovation, but I think it could actually be detrimental in the long run. Okay. So, Frederick, uh, representing NASDAQ, uh, one of the points that Yasid made was that uh, the, what we can expect is perhaps more a market for inst institutions. The Andreas says that inst institutions first turn to the dark pools and then as a perhaps second instant come, come to you at the exchange. Uh, what, what is your take on this? I think, first of all, we, I think we have to separate today and in these last sessions. It clearly is the focus on all of this discussion, latency and algo, is very much driven by the equity market. Mm. So, of course, if you look at the fixed income market here in the Nordics, there is a totally different world. There is no latency discussion, algo discussions like that. So I think it's, it's, we, we, we have to sort of the market we operate is much more than just equity market. And this is a very specific equity market discussions we have right, right now. Yeah. Um, in, 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 in terms of what we have to provide, if we stay with equity market, of course, is sort of a market where you can trade in the fashion you, you want to, uh, where we have the liquidity in the market that is needed. Okay. Um, and I think it, we need sort of the diversity of both maybe the traditional market making, primary dealers, plainly a bank who put up their balance sheet to support liquidity in the market. That's extremely important. But then we have all these sort of more new type of liquidity providers, the algo traders and sort of the, the HFT firms. They also proven in sort of several studies that sort of they provide liquidity also in the market. And I think the combination of sort of the more traditional market making and this new type of liquidity provider is important because we have different needs. I mean, we have heard one need from Yasid, you have one need, maybe Jens has a different need. And if I go to Nordnet or Avanza and talk to them, they have a, certainly a different need. So, so we have to make sure that we can provide liquidity and, and fair trading to all type of participants uh, in all market. Uh, and then you need different solutions. So. Uh, coming into that, we, we sort of, it has been very much sort of a central limit order book. There has been sort of the, the way you traded uh, equities, and there has been this sort of speed discussion and, and latency. But, but exactly for, for the reason that Andreas and Yasid said, we now see, start to see sort of traditional exchanges like us implementing, like we have done Ocean on Demand. You said Euronex has something similar block facilities because of the ch maybe a little bit the change that we see that there are much more of ins institutional ownership and we need to adjust the way we sort of provide trading opportunities to all type of players. Mm. 
Okay, we're going to open up for questions from the floor soon, so prepare your questions. But first, uh, perhaps, Yasid, do you want to add to what um, uh, we have said uh, so far? No, I, I would agree with many of the points uh, said. I think the, so the key point is that we are here today where the latency arbitrage has been minimized. But we shouldn't forget that actually a huge cost has come out of the financial sector to other sectors, including the infrastructure sector, the, the, the microwave link providers, and so on. So, you know, it is a cost that has channeled out, and someone is paying for that cost. Um, yeah. um, on the fragmentation question, I think in many cases, I think this was pointed out earlier, it's a competition question rather than a price question. And sometimes it's a nuisance, um, but we, we find that our brokers tend to quite quickly link to new venues where appropriate. Um, but excessive intermediation through fragmentation is not necessarily a good thing for the market. OK. So do we have any questions from the floor? Can you take the, the microphone? So the point I made is that the growth in passive investing chart did not include ETFs, but of course ETFs are now approximately, depending on the data source, three trillion or thereabouts, so it's the size of the hedge fund industry. And to your point, the trading in ETFs can be sometimes even more excessive than the underlying securities basket that they represent, particularly for the most liquid ETFs. Um, so we do monitor this space uh, with great interest. Um, I think ETFs are here to stay, um, but it's really a question of whether they will operate and cause some potential systemic risk in the market. Regulators may be looking at that type of data as well, particularly when there is a misfunction where one underlying stock, for example, is not trading, and then you have the diversions between the underlying stocks basket and the ETF. So that can cause an issue. We at MBIM were not users of ETFs, but we do monitor that space. So there is potential risks that could come out when that divergence takes place. In general, that tends to correct itself. I mean, for example, the regulator's usage of uh, limits on the price movements has been enormously helpful to the market where it triggers a stop and then uh, reactivate that trading. I might just add on that, um, you've talked about ETFs that are very, very active. I think one area that's more of more concern is when you have an ETF that the liquidity is much better than the underlying product. So, you know, bond ETFs are a good example where they're trading a basket of really illiquid bonds and yet the spreads are tiny. To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think that's a risk that uh, the regulators need to be thinking about. Anyone else on that? Other questions? Yes. Uh, so I wonder what, uh, to what extent you guys are concerned about information leakage that comes from your orders that sit in dark pools, and if there's anything that you guys uh, try to do to try to mitigate that, that leakage. I can uh, speak on that first. Um, we, we measure all our trades, obviously. Um, we look at um, any anomalies on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we try to do um, we try to do a venue analysis so we see where which which venues are the most toxic and where we get the most kind of market um, movements posted uh, trading but that's really really difficult to do so uh, we rely very heavily on on the uh, the brokers that we interact with and are very clear that a big part of of the commission that we pay to them for trading is to make sure that they have um, up-to-date technology and that they have a, um, uh, you know, put a lot of effort and, and resources into making sure they have good technology. We also do uh, a fair amount of, of on-site due diligence visiting with our brokers every year to make sure that they are up to standard. I mean, I, I, I think that's why we are so uh, sort of pro transparent market uh, because of this and I, and I think a little bit in if you look into MIFI 2 maybe what the regulators are aiming at a little bit is to try to set a little bit of sort of thresholds for sort of understanding that dark pools might be needed especially for large players uh, and for institutional trades but maybe not 
to be used for retail because of the lesser transparency and you would like to set these thresholds and especially if you can measure that the, the more transparent order book have sufficient liquidity then I would say dark pool plays very little role and, and you, sh you should avoid that risk that you are playing. But then of course I don't know also if again coming back to AI and, and machine <coughs> intelligence I'm sure that there will be tools when you start to aggregate data from, from everywhere that actually can benchmark how good your dark pool was in, in the execution and that sort of how, how, you, how you did compared to other dark pools. So I think machine intelligence will introduce tools in the market that will help you benchmark your trading across different venues. Any more questions? So let me uh, uh, take a question. Um, uh, Sanjeev talked in the morning about market efficiency and how we can uh, um, measure market efficiency. Um, market efficiency is uh, about that uh, the, the prices in the market should reflect all relevant inf information about the asset. So the price equals the value. Now, uh, there is a, an, uh, a popular paraphrase of a quote of uh, Oscar Wilde saying that algorithms know the price of everything but the value of nothing. <laughs> so, uh, um, if the algorithms don't know the value, uh, who, who should know the value? Perhaps the fundamental analysts. But this is a profession that is now being squeezed from, from many sides, you could say. We have the, the rise of passive investing. We have um, an increase of algorithms taking over the, the, the tasks that the financial analysts have done in the past through, uh, for, for example, text mining and other tools. And then on top of that, uh, that is not from the, from the technology development, but from the regulatory, we have the unbundling, uh, that uh, it's now becoming more clear what the cost of paying for research uh, is. So um, what I'm trying to get to here is that uh, perhaps uh, uh, there is a limit where the automation uh, becomes uh, a risk that we, uh, we Perhaps when we uh, cut out these uh, traditional professions, there is something that they provided that we lose, such as market efficiency, that uh, they could uh, perhaps identify the true value of a, of a firm. Uh, so I'd like to ask the panel if you think this is a, a risk, uh, that price discovery is undermined, or perhaps an opportunity for uh, active investors that remain in the market. Um, who would like to uh, uh, respond to that? So I'm happy to, to give, okay. it a, give it a start, and then I'm sure others will have, have things to add. I think, um, you know, passive investing has had a bad name recently. I mean, there's been research reports describing passive investing as equivalent to Marxism, um, and that, you know, passive investing, um, you know, restricts competition between firms, etc. Um, and one of the issues that comes up is that price discovery will be affected. Um, but if you think about it from um, a market efficiency point of view, if you've if, if the market becomes less efficient, um, it creates more opportunities for active investors. And perhaps if you think about who is it that's shifting to passive investors, it's perhaps to passive investing, it's perhaps investors who are not so good at the active style of investing. So what, mean, what that means is you're left with better active managers in the market on average, perhaps. And so in the long term, that should perhaps um, improve the, the quality of active management. Um, I guess the question is, though, are there frictions that will prevent that from happening? Um, and maybe there's frictions around fees. So active managers obviously have been um, historically charging very high fees, and unless they have the capacity to, to reduce those fees and therefore improve their after um, cost performance, um, then that's obviously going to restrict moves into, into active, active investing. Yes? Well, I'll put it like this, that we sort of... We're pretty big fish in one sense that we have around four. It depends on your calculator. We have four to bi forty to sixty billion uh, US dollars, in, sort of in terms of asset management. Now, the question is, we are now working very much with indexes, and we do that because we have, I think, we have eighteen different portfolios uh, that we shop up everything into, and that means that the number of people 
with us that actually do analysis of the markets. I'm not talking about the sort of all the uh, nitty gritty around it, or three plus me. So we are four people dealing with how to invest, going back and forth, and, and things like that. Um, and then we have some sort of we own parts of a big chunk of a bank. Then we need to have sort of stock analytics to, to compare that. We are slowly, slowly getting accustomed to the idea that we will, that we are right now a bit of a, uh, uh, leaning on everybody else. And we realize that the bigger we get, we need to maybe think about pick, being into the stock picking market. And if we do that, then we need to invest in equity analysis. And I think that uh, the problem there is that uh, uh, I think what you need to do is, you, as being sort of insurance and with all the regulation, you need to know what you buy. And that means you cannot just uh, uh, order uh, sort of uh, research. You need yeah. to follow it by yourself. And the problem is then, if you then start hiring people when they know five equities, uh, then the problem is, of course, well, how likely is that they will actually say that all the five things I've learned my whole life, don't buy it. Uh, uh, so it gets complicated. But we are slowly, slowly getting accustomed that we are getting so big that we need to take responsibility. And with all that comes all the issues about uh, being in, in the board of uh, nomination committee, being a sort of what happens if, if you're a big owner of Ericsson, how are you going to step in and that. And that means even more and more people. So. That's uh, uh, sort of how I see it. Do you want to chip in? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I could add. I mean, uh, just to on on the passive side and also on the AI side, and the two forces that are an, under play here. I mean, on on the passive side, arguably, what is the equilibrium level for passive investment versus active for the markets to 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 be well functioning? I mean, from an economics point of view, I guess it takes two or three market participants with heterogeneous views to create a market and the trade can take place. Of course, one of those uh, participants is probably processing data suboptimally. And at some point, they come to the realization that there is an error in their ways, and then the price will move towards its fundamental value. So the process can take place. The difference is that the passive investment, that realization never occurs at the security level. But it does occur potentially at the asset allocation level when you decide to sell your ETF holistically. So there is potential for heterogeneous views to develop more, um, more so, I think, when AI comes into play, if indeed the academics and, and some hedge funds and other market participants are using AI um, to produce forecasts of market prices, that potentially can add heterogeneity to the market, which in itself will add more trading and potential more diversity to the marketplace. So I don't think it's all bad news. It's just that there will be more divergent views. I think the passive side itself will have some negative impact potentially on volatility, at least in the short term. So that, that we've seen with, with the usage of ETFs, for example. Thank you. But I could add a little bit on the passive investing. We obviously have index, index fund, and, and one thing um, you need to remember that index funds typically trade at the close, which moves liquidity from other parts of the day, obviously. So there is a, a concentration during, uh, I mean, I think it's around 20% of, of, of lit volume takes place on the auction, uh, which is a, could be a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing. It's because you never know what the auction price is going to be at any particular day. So you take, it's a, if you're a, a non-index investor, take a big risk waiting for liquidity in the auction. Um, when it comes to unbundling, um, I think for me, unbundling is a lot about providing best execution, not overpaying for execution with your client's money uh, for something that you don't really know what the value is. And I think that's a good thing that we, it's, it's coming to an end. <clears throat> the, the downside of that is that there is, I don't know, it's 10, 10 15,000 stocks to invest in globally. Uh, it's incredibly important for um, the capitalization of the whole market that we have sufficient coverage from analysts. Because even if you're not, not a fundamental active investor, you rely on the, the uh, uh, forecasts 
that these analysts makes, and that put, it gets put in these databases that you can use if you are uh, a, a robo advisor or if you are a, uh, a quantitative investor. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to be a little bit um, conscious of that, uh, that that could be the downside of, of bundling. Do we have a question from the floor? Sanjeev? Yeah, there is time. So, so I'm seeing there's a, there's a certain piece of the asset manager market that's used use text a lot. And we going to these conferences and seeing 200 people show up. And they're buying three types of data. One is very high frequency data coming off tweet streams and putting them to some kind of trading setup. The other one is uh, farming huge amounts of news. So companies like Ravenfact, for example, are generating macro signals out of, out of news and using that. And then the third type is sort of looking at slightly slow moving data like you know, board minutes of companies and, and uh, what central bank governors write in their speeches and you know, that sort of stuff and getting signals from that. And uh, I guess all of you might have looked at this and decided one way or the other to sort of step into it as a, as a source of information which was, wasn't sort of widely used three, four years ago. Uh, what's your prognosis for whether that's going anywhere? Or so, <laughs> I don't know if everyone heard the question. It, it, uh, it's about uh, the, the increase of text mining as a, new, as a, as a new technology to re obtain a signal about uh, where the economy is headed. And, uh, what, what, so what does the panel think about um, the future of, of this development? I can say something that's not exactly that ball game, but I'm, I'm, I'm see if I can move into it. And that sort of, I've, I've shifted a bit. I, when I came to the insurance industry, I thought that um, um, we could use a lot of big data on it to do a lot of analytics. And that was my thought until actually two months ago. Now I'm starting to understand more and more, and th th let's see if I get to you, is that in order to do that, you need to save a lot of data internal data, and data is dangerous. Data is extremely dangerous with what we talked about before, GDPR. So having your own internal data means that you're vulnerable. And that means that somebody, well, let's be honest, no, I think no uh, firm in, in Sweden at least can protect somebody from if they really want to steal something from it. And that means then you're extremely up to the, the ropes because uh, the regulator will come after you and you need to pay huge fines if you do something wrong there. So we're getting more into the situation where we don't want to have data. We see it more as a toxic data. So what we, when we get data, my thinking is more and more about it, get rid of it <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, because your internal data is dangerous because you t t need to take so much liability uh, by having it. And that means that you're going to use much more because what you can do, and that's getting into your question, is that you can get so much information from the data outside. So if I want to find out if somebody's a, a good insurance customer or not, uh, well, then you, my first thought was, okay, look into the data. Well. No, don't go into Facebook and do uh, sort of look at Facebook and look t what is it 12 likes and we can find out whether it's a good or a bad person. We don't do it, but I'm just saying that the data is out there and don't use the internal data. It's pretty close what you asked about. Any more comments on that? I think I think on bundling um, in Europe and the sort of decline in in analyst type research is going to mean people are going to have to rely on text mining type of data um, in the absence of any other information. I think some of the news wires are uh, you know, providing um, reports around earnings events um, for smaller companies which get no coverage, so some coverage is, is obviously better than nothing. Mm. Okay, so uh, this day started with an exciting session about blockchain. And uh, I thought perhaps we can uh, wrap up the day with, with that topic as well. Uh, one of the first applications that Cam Harvey mentioned is that we can get rid of the T plus 3 settlement and turn to T0 or immediate settlement, perhaps. And uh, there is a paper on the program about this tomorrow as well. So, uh, Frederick, you are working with uh, Nasdaq Clearing and it's a lot about blockchain today. So, uh, 
what benefit can, do you foresee that this can bring to, to the investor community? Yes, I think, I mean, as you say, if, as Yassid said also, that was two, three hundred milliseconds to microseconds to, to sort of execute and, and do all of that stuff. And then you have 260 seconds to get the share. Of course, there are sort of room to do something here uh, if you have sort of a different process, because I think that's sort of how we look at blockchain. Blockchain is a technology for us. Um, you can do a tech refresh. You can throw out your existing system and put in blockchain and then do exactly the same thing. I don't know how much you gain from that. Um, but if you think about blockchain as an enabler to maybe rethink the way we process uh, some of the sort of procedures within the post trade, uh, payments, settlements, collateral management, all the area which requires a lot of transaction being sent back and forth, a lot of reconciliation, a lot of third parties intermediary in, in, involved, uh, and I would argue also a lot of costs. Uh, um, within that area, I think blockchain can, can and will play an important role. Then there is this discussion, will blockchain replace clearinghouses in total? Can you sort of get rid of a clearinghouse because it's peer-to-peer -peer settlement of the transaction and it's happening in real time, so there is no settlement risk. Um, I, I'm biased a little bit, but I don't think so. Um, I, I think especially for a derivative CCP who might sit on transaction for uh, six months up to 10 years, where you actually more manage to sort of the counterparty credit risk and set them in, just the short of a, in the short end of the life cycle of the contract. I don't think you can replace a central counterparty as such with a blockchain solution because you will lose out on the default management, on the sort of multi multilateral netting. But we shouldn't see clearing or post trade as a sort of big back black box. I mean, there are a lot of different processes taking place. And I'm pretty sure that within, as I said, payments, settlement, collateral management, reconciliation, we and, and many here do a lot of trade reporting today uh, to, to uh, authorities. And if you would have a distributed ledger with all the information, access to the regulators, we wouldn't have to send these, I don't know, millions of transactions every year to regulators in MIFID 1, MIFID 2, EMIR, ARM, APA, and all of that. It's, it's just, so I think clearly there is so much potential with blockchain, and right now there is so much investment put into trying to figure out how to utilize that in the public market, not only in sort of proof of concepts, closed world, but in real public markets. We do a lot there, uh, and we will continue to do that because we believe in it. And, uh, and I think it's going to create efficiency and, and lower the cost in the post trade. Hmm. So uh, those of you coming from the industry, do you see this as a, a big uh, potential to uh, introduce blockchain in in uh, equity trading and uh, in uh, in other assets. Well, I'm no I'm no expert uh, by any stretch, but I, I think that any anything that will cut down the costs or, or the time of, of settlement is is a good thing. Um, it, it's, it's early days still, I think. Yeah. Uh, so the proof is in the pudding. But I think uh, anything that can do that is helpful for us. And we are on, not there yet. Agreed. I think the asset management industry could be a beneficiary of these technologies, not exclusively blockchain, but I think it mm. remains to be seen how that could be implemented. Um, what is the motivation behind it? It's really to make things more efficient. In some cases, some entities that have moved into that direction are perhaps in a state where their technology is so archaic that they need to make this transformational move. And whether that transformational move is optimal or suboptimal, I think, is, is still an open question. But this is why we have Cam Harvey and Sanjeev and others to educate us on that matter. So. Excellent. I think that will be the, the last word from the panel. and. Uh, to conclude, I, I think, after all, we have a rather optimistic view on fintech also in, in this segment.